Well, on the show today, our big focus, Antibodies have become a familiar word during this pandemic era. But when crucial vaccine data was released, the spotlight then panned to an unsung immune player, the T cells, especially after reports and studies emerged that antibodies wane after a few weeks or months of uh, having contracted the coronavirus. And this raised fears of possibility of reinfection in people who have suffered uh, from coronavirus. Well, to talk more about this, we're joined by Dr. Eric Fiegelding, epidemiologist from Washington, who's going to take us uh, through this. Thank you so much uh, for speaking us, uh, to us, doctor. Now, there's been a lot of worry over reports of the antibodies waning, but now we're also told that T cells can give us protection. Can you tell us more about this? So there's two parts of your immune system. Well, there's more than two, but the A, there's the antibodies, which are shaped like these Ys, uh, and they do wane. And but thing is, even if the your antibodies drop, it doesn't mean you have lost the antibody immunity. Your body holds uh, an, a library archive of all the antibodies against every single virus you've ever had since you were a child. So every single illness you've, your virus, X bacteria you've been exposed to, your body knows how to conquer it, and it's stored in your memory B cells. So just because the antibodies is not circulating a high volumes uh, doesn't mean you you don't have immunity. And separately, there's also separate T cell immunity and T cell immunity, media immunity, is another way of fighting the virus. So there's, and the vaccines right now are improving both the antibody as well as the T cell. And even if the antibody drops, your body still remembers how to fight it. So next time it sees the virus. So I would not worry. All right, so that's good to know that you remain protected and the T-cells are these unsung heroes of uh, immunity. Now, there's also been a lot of change in the type of medication since the b beginning of this pandemic, from hydroxychloroquine uh, to remdesivir to steroids being used to plasma therapy being used. If you could tell us a bit about these, this uh, changing medication. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence that's coming out and some drugs are proving to be effective, some drugs are not. Hydroxychloroquine in all the randomized trials has not been shown to reduce deaths and has not been shown to prevent uh, infection. There, these trials found that it had no effect. But for the steroid dexamethasone, it has some effects for reducing mortality among those who were on ventilators or needing oxygen, but not on less sick people. So those are, uh, that's a very uh, late stage drug. Remdesivir will shorten duration of illness, but it doesn't show that it reduces deaths per se. But remdesivir is very expensive. And then there's convalescent plasma, where you transfer uh, and transfuse someone else who was infected but recovered and take their plasma, their blood, and put it in someone who's sick to improve their health. That one, we believe, definitely should work. But, but ultimately, the solution will be a vaccine in many months' time. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Eric, for joining us and, uh, you know, sharing that information with us. Well, now uh, to our newsmaker today, we're joined by Dr. Fahim Yunus, Chief of Infectious Diseases, University of Maryland, to talk about a whole range of issues uh, concerning coronavirus. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, uh, there have been several studies that have indicated COVID antibodies disappear after a few weeks or months. We were just discussing this with Dr. Eric, and this has raised a lot of worries about reinfection, but doctors are also talking about T cells providing a protection. If you can also tell us a bit about this. Yeah, I don't think the antibodies tell the whole story. It's very common for antibodies to decline, but the body is very smart. Human body cannot be fooled twice easily because there are multiple limbs, multiple arms of immunity. B cells are which produce the antibody, but then there are T cells. T cells are more like memory cells. They remember an invader. They would remember a virus. So if you get the same virus second time, the body is prepared. The body knows exactly which antibody to generate again very quickly. So I do not think people should be worried about reinfections. At a test positive again does not 
be infected. Usually that's the dead viral genome, which is still lurking around in the respiratory system. And these PCR tests are highly sensitive tests, so they will take that small little part of the virus all right, uh, Doctor, also, what are your hopes regarding the vaccine? There's this race across the world uh, to, uh, uh, to arrive at that vaccine. Moderna vaccine is in the final uh, stage of the trials. And then the challenge also is to, after that, provide it to the public at large. I think since the beginning of this pandemic, I've said we should avoid the extreme. One extreme is denial, where people think it's just a flu. And the other extreme is panic. Once again, it will happen with vaccine as well. One extreme is extreme happiness, as if a button will be pressed and the pandemic will go. The other extreme is, which is oh, the industry scam. Vaccines typically take five to ten years to develop. So, in my career, I have never seen one vaccine, let alone twenty vaccines, getting developed in a year. So, I think that's great optimism. I've never seen so many please come together and try new technology. I've never seen governments give this kind of financial support to vaccine. I have never seen this kind of scaling and manufacturing. So all of that is superb, it's very good. So we need to be cautious. Developing a vaccine is one thing, but then getting it to your arm is another. There's a very long chain. They say there are many a slip between a cup and a lip. So we need to be careful when we promise. It will be available. I believe FDA will give it approval. It's already reviewing the data. Where we may run into challenges, number one, we still have to test. We will have to see what's the efficacy of this vaccine. Is it going to be? It's not going to be 100%. So people need to understand that. There may be, there will be people who will get the vaccine and get the coronavirus infection again. That will happen. I can tell you today. Chances are they will be much milder okay. infection. Somebody who was going to end up in an ICU will probably just have a fever at home and recover. So it will create milder illness, number one. Number two, access. We don't know how this vaccine will be distributed. Remember, we could not give people enough PPE or enough coronavirus tests. To assume that we will be able to give 7 billion vaccines <clears throat> is, is, again, not logical. So once again, we will have to remain patient and wait in line because people who are at the highest risk, the essential workers, are likely going to get first nursing home, elderly, immunocompromised, and then at some stage it will get to general population. I think what is important for people to remember, if this was a cricket match, I think we're still in the first innings. If this is a one-day match, we have not gotten to the halftime. All right. Well, that's a very sobering thought there. Uh, Doctor, also there are fears about the impact that uh, coronavirus has on young people, also on children. There's some cases of lung damage. Uh, we're told about this Kawasaki syndrome, children developing very serious illnesses. Are these uh, very rare cases? Yeah, there are multiple nuances. I will say there are many shades of gray, and let's look at them one by one. Number one, there's we all believe that 30 to 40 percent of people with coronavirus don't even have symptoms. So forget about long-term disease. They don't even have symptoms of the original disease. So that's hope 40 percent of people right off the bat. Then we all believe that 80 to 90 percent of the people don't even need a hospitalization. The third part is when you have long-term, and then we know that symptom recovery is small. Remember, your body just fought against a pandemic, not a flu, pandemic. It took physical and mental toll. What I'm seeing in my patients, I've now treated hundreds of patients, that it takes longer to recover. This is not a cold that goes away in a week. You may get better 70 to 80% in two weeks, but the last 20% recovery may be very slow. It may take two or three months, but you will recover. Will there be a small number of people who have long term impact? That is cool. uh, Now, the way I look at that is somebody who was likely to die in an ICU, instead of dying, they stayed in an ICU on a ventilator for a month and got to go home. If their lungs are not 100% functioning, now it's a question of perspective. You can say, well, they have long-term damage, and I can say they get to live. They were going to live. So I think there are multiple aspects here. We need to empathize. Yes, there will be a small number, but whether it will be 0.1% or 1% or 10%, nobody knows that number. 
So I believe that we again should understand all the shades of grey. All right, that gives a very comforting uh, perspective as well. But doctor, uh, now we're hearing about what's being described as a second wave or resurgence of coronavirus uh, in Europe. Uh, there have also been talks of uh, mutations of the virus. So how worried should we be about this? That's different for different viruses. HIV mutations are different than influenza mutations that are different than coronavirus mutations. So far, the good thing is Coronavirus mutates, but these are non-consequential mutations. They do not change the mode of transmission. It remains droplet. They do not change the severity of this infection and most likely will have no impact on the vaccine. When you see a bunch of human beings in the bazaar, they all look different, but they're all human. They all eat and drink and they all have the same lifespan. So look at coronavirus similarly. There are tons of mutations. There may be little differences in all of them, but at the end of the day, they're all coronaviruses. They all live and die by the same rule, which is good for us. That means our treatment, our understanding of the virus does not change by mutations. Yes, in Hollywood, you get X-Men, but in the world, coronavirus is dull and boring when it comes to mutations, and that's very good. All right. Well, Dr. Yunus, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Now, India is the only country in Asia which has not bent or managed to flatten its COVID curve uh, among all the nations with significant daily caseload are being reported in India every single day. The daily fatality rate is also much higher than of any other countries in Asia. You can take a look at that graph and see how India's curve goes uh, up and up. In fact, uh, today we've reported over 52,000 cases of coronavirus. India is the third worst hit country in the world when it comes uh, to coronavirus. If we look at uh, after US and Brazil. So there you can see uh, the curve as far as other uh, Asian countries go. And as we said today, India reported over 50,000 cases in a day, taking the total number of cases in the country to 15,83,792. Well, to talk more about how India is doing and whether uh, you know there is a community transmission in India, we're now joined by Professor Prabhat Jha, an Indian a Canadian epidemiologist and health economist uh, working in the field of global health. Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, Professor Jha, how do you read India's numbers? Our cases are the highest in Asia. We're number three in the world. At the same time, we're told there's only a local community transmission. It's not in the entire country. Well, they're all different. And I think it's fair to say that the Indian response was um, too slow in a few things. One, for a long time, the Indian Council of Medical Research uh, kept claiming there's no community transmission, which is just pure fantasy. Community transmission in India has been occurring probably from February onwards. And instead of saying, oh, there's no community transmission or having a debate on this, they should have been focused on what's needed to interrupt transmission, which was expanding testing, doing more isolation. I think, unfortunately, the lockdown had both a good effect in slowing the virus growth, but it was also should be called the, not just India's great lockdown, but India's great exodus. When the lockdown occurred, hundreds of thousands of young men in particular went from urban areas. Let's say they went from Mumbai out to Bihar, and many of them probably carried the virus with them. Now in the lockdown situation, they go back to their village in Bihar and they don't infect the whole village, but they do infect their parents or their wives. So that's where we need to investigate where the deaths are occurring. The other thing I think it is important is the cell companies, the mobile companies of India are sitting on a vast amount of data about what were the migration patterns for the last few months. They should publicly re release it. They should release where were the big movements of people, because that's where then you can look for the virus cases and for the deaths. So there's a lot that every sector of the country can do, because India is not winning its battle on COVID. It needs to do more, and it needs to do it quickly and urgently. 
All right, that's a very interesting suggestion about the mobile companies. Also, uh, Professor, have we lost the gains then that were made by the countrywide lockdown that was uh, called initially? It was the largest lockdown anywhere in the world. And uh, was, but however, this increase, this surge in cases given our population, was it inevitable after the lockdown eased? Well, the true lockdown was not a proper lockdown because what happened is it did not keep people in place. Uh, for example, one of our programmers, the, despite the fact that he's got a good job and was working in Bangalore, was kicked out of his uh, paying guest uh, place uh, in Bangalore and had to go to Andhra um, as this is one of the consequences of the lockdown. And this happened 100,000 times or more over in the country. And so that spread infection, we now know pretty reliably that community transmission must have been occurring in February and March, right throughout the urban areas, the big urban areas of India. And so the lockdown wasn't a true lockdown. It was an also an exodus. So I think there's both positive effects of slowing the growth, but negative effects of causing a mass out migration. So what it means now is the testing strategies, the combinations of trying to figure out where deaths have occurred really need to be ramped up quickly and urgently. And I really urge the health minister, Dr. Harshvardhan, to take a lead and make sure that these data are quickly assembled on an emergency basis. With those data, you'll be able to know where are the hotspots, where does more testing sites need to be, where do local ordinances on uh, local lockdowns need to happen. Uh, without those efforts, then unfortunately, we'll have to just suffer this slow growth and have an, a major disruption of our economy and of the social fabric of the country. And that's avoidable. Data are the key to making sure that the control of the epidemic does occur. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jha, for joining us and uh, sharing those thoughts with us. Well, with that, time for us to slip into a short break. Coming up on the other side, our viewer question segment, and Dr. Vijay Hadda will be taking those questions today. Welcome back. Well, it's time now for our Mythbusters segment. We take a look at valve masks and are they defeating the purpose? N95 masks are the strongest protection. However, not all N95 masks can prevent you from getting infected with COVID-19. India's Director General for Health Services has warned against a certain kind of N95 mask with valve respirators in them. These masks do not stop the virus from spreading. They are also detrimental to measures adopted for its containment. So, N95 masks with valves only filter inhaled air. They do not stop the virus from being exhaled. Now, if you are a COVID carrier, you will infect others if your mask has a valve. The Indian Health Ministry recommends homemade cloth masks for daily use. All right, so I hope that uh, clarifies the valve mask question. Well, uh, let's now get uh, viewer questions, and we're joined by Dr. Uh, Vijay Hada, Associate Professor, Pulmon Pulmonary Medicine at Ames. Thank you so much for sparing your time, doctor. Let's just get you the first question. My name is Bindu. My question is, what is the most common mode of uh, transmission of coronavirus? All right, Dr. Hada, the most uh, common uh, mode of transmission of coronavirus. See, uh, the coronavirus can transmit from one person to another in i think the most important uh, way will be the droplet infection which uh, all of us are aware of and with repeated uh, advertisements on television as well as other media we are uh, advertising it means whenever a coronavirus is has infected someone or means a patient who is having covid 19 Hmm. If he sneezes, cough, or sometimes speaks, he bring out droplets. And those droplets, if somebody come in contact with those droplets, the person can get infection of coronavirus. So I think this is the most common form of the transmission. And uh, the other form of transmission include, uh, as soon as a person speaking or coughing or sneezing, the droplets will come down to a surface. Let us see the mobile which is uh, there or maybe laptop or maybe sometimes we touch our hands so 
hmm. the virus can be a, go to those objects and whenever a person touches those objects then those uh, objects will transmit the virus to the hands of the person who is touching those and as soon as that person will touch the their mouth nose or eyes the virus get entry into the body All and right. this is the uh, this is another uh, mode of transmission which is called as transmission by fomites All then right. third which is uh, which is uh, nowadays is uh, in talk or many people are discussing this is airborne infection means it can spread through air also although there is this this mode is not very prominent one but there is some data that virus can spread through air also all right uh, thank you so much for that doctor and we have a young viewers question go ahead hi everyone my name is jiana singh and i study in fifth grade i want to ask a question related to corona is corona a natural virus or a man made virus and how many strains has it got all right dr hadda this question i, I know there's been a lot of conspiracy around it but whether it's man made or natural oh my god such a little kid and it asks so difficult question <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a, it's difficult to answer but till now it is thought that it's not a man made virus uh, is probably a naturally occurring virus which have got mutated and uh, all of us have got infection from that uh, there is no data till date which suggests that it is a man made virus at least no confirmatory data All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hadda, for answering those questions. We know a WHO team is in fact in China uh, looking for just those answers. And finally, we bring you a superstar Amitabh Bachchan's tribute to our medical workers. Uh, Amitabh Bachchan, who is currently being treated for COVID in Mumbai's Nanavati Hospital, along with his son Abhishek, shared a new appreciation post for healthcare workers. The 77-year-old described healthcare workers as God's own angels in white PPE units and showered them with a whole lot of praise. for working in extreme conditions to cure their patients he shared two photographs of prayers that healthcare workers say every day for the better recovery of their patients and wrote they work in extreme conditions so our conditions are safe the god's own angels in white ppe units doctors nurses support staff yet they still take time out to pray for who they struggle to cure their patients this be their prayer every day Right, so appreciation there uh, from Amitabh Bachchan to all our frontline workers. Well, with that, uh, that's all I have on the show today. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.